Hi, I'm Tom Geiler, and welcome to this edition of OCTV. We're celebrating Women's History Month here at the Mansion House, and I'm here with the wonderful Monica Mercado, Assistant Professor of History at Colgate University, who's going to talk to us a little bit about women and gender here at the Mansion House. Thanks, Tom. Um, I think that the Mansion House is such an exciting place for talking about women's history. I think we often think of stories like John Humphrey Noyes, right, the founder and patriarch, or we talk about this building and all of its iterations, or Oneida Community Limited, mm -hmm. right, and the sort of history of this company um, and its importance to the area. But I think embedded in all those stories are really interesting histories about women and gender and what this place could be. Um, so we're in the library, one of my favorite spaces in the mansion house. Um, not just because I like to read a lot of books, but because it's a reminder to me of the ways that women at the Oneida community um, had the possibility and the opportunity to engage in community with men in ways that 19th century women barely could have dreamed of. Um, so I often tell people when I'm here, um, I think about this phrase that Ellen Wayland Smith uses, in her book, On Oneida, right, the writer and descendant, she says that the Oneida community was kind of like a practical workshop mm. in gender. Um, and I think that that wording is really useful, right? That a workshop is a place where you experiment and you try out new ideas. Um, and the women here um, <laughs> tried out a whole lot of new ideas um, and they had access to books and magazines, the latest periodicals, there are images of women sitting at the tables around us with men in intellectual community with men, um, which we don't see in 19th century America. Very few places offered such educational possibilities uh, to white middle-class women and fewer, almost none, offered co-educational possibilities. Um, so when I'm in this room, I think about those possibilities, and I should add, of course, that maybe they had that time on their hands because Oneida liberated them in the early years um, from something most 19th century American women um, were very familiar with, which was, of course, uh, childbearing. And so if you, by plan, um, are not having children, um, right, having a child could be sometimes medically the most dangerous thing you could do in 19th century America. What possibilities open up to you um, as a woman in community, at study, at work, um, in, in this place? Um, so another thing that I like to think about when I think about women in the first decades of the Oneida community are the ways that they lived um, and one of the things that I think is really important to thinking about this is even how they dressed. Um, this is an example of short dress uh, that women at the Oneida community agreed to wear um, in the first years of the community. And it is deeply different than most 19th century middle class white women's dress. There's no hoop skirt, there's no corseting or petticoat. Um, the short dress is, in fact, a shorter dress with a pair of pantaloons. Um, and you might say, why does this matter? But in fact, um, I think that's something that many women's rights reformers were thinking about in the 19th century um, were bodies and bodily autonomy or freedoms. Uh, and what you wear, how constraining it was, um, is integral to thinking about how you spend your days. John Humphrey Noyes was really interested in the idea of the short dress. He suggested it, um, which is an interesting thing to note, right? He had the idea and he sort of suggested it to the women of the community who tried it out in those early years um, and decided to go for it. They also cut their hair a little shorter and you can see that in lots of images of the community. Um, not too short probably not much <laughs> shorter than my hair is now. Um, but these made Oneida community women distinctive in their dress. Um, and I think that dress isn't just fashion, it's a way of thinking about how um, these women were sort of imagining their world 
um, and part of building something new. Um, and we pay attention to their dress as well um, because it comes just about the same time that many women's rights activists, um, even here in upstate New York, were thinking about dress and what they called dress reform um, as part of their early feminism. Again, to offer women more freedom of movement um, and to change really the way that they live. So often when we think about women's history in the Oneida community, in the 19th century, we're look at looking at places that go against the grain, um, times when what women are doing here um, is very different than what most women are doing in mainstream America. But I also like looking at examples of advertising from Oneida Community Limited silverware uh, in the 20th century uh, because they remind me that uh, Community Limited was really good uh, at advertising and promotion and they very much line up with ideas about women and gender and marriage in 20th century America. Um, they're not revolutionary in this way. They're deeply ingrained in conversations, uh, particularly around uh, World War II and post-war America. So I'm looking at two advertisements from Community Limited uh, that really show how much the company is tapping in uh, to the ideas of gender roles in wartime. Um, the slogan, Back Home for Keeps, um, is really relying on these metaphors um, of hoping, praying, and wishing um, for the men who are fighting abroad uh, to come back and to come back and make a home with American women. Um, these kinds of ads um, are within the imaginings of what some historians call readjustment, making sure that after World War II um, that the home and family uh, would be strong and readjust um, those men to life back um, on the home front. And if you look at some of the wording um, in these ads, um, they're dreaming of the day to speed the work for war. Um, are you doing your own personal post-war planning? So are we, and the day will come. Um, these ads are suggesting, of course, that if you buy silverware, you buy these fine things for your home, um, you make the home while your boyfriend or husband is away, um, that that home will be ready for him when he comes back, back home for keeps. Thank you so much, Monica, for stopping by and, and giving us such a great history lesson of uh, women in the 19th century into the 20th century. It's been so great to have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, and stay tuned for more content on OCTV. Thanks for tuning in.